Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the October 2024 meeting of the Durham Bicycle, Pedestrian and Advisory Commission. I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, we presently have 16 active members, which means we need nine for a quorum. And by my count, we have 11. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start, as we always do, with the reading of our land acknowledgement. Let me get that up on the screen. And uh, Mary Rose has agreed to read this. Please go ahead. We, as the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, want to begin this meeting by affirming BPAC's commitment to equity and racial justice. We would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on lands that have served as the home for diverse Indigenous communities long before current governments were established here. We pay our respect to the elders and members of these communities, both past and present, and recognize the harms of genocide and colonialism. We will make a conscious effort to reflect on the following questions as we advance through our business and contemplate changes in our community. And we recognize that achieving equity requires our commitment to, the, to an ongoing process. How can we seek to repair harm with our work and not erase history? How does our work impact the vulnerability and safety of people who hold many intersecting marginalized identities, including black, indigenous, and people of color, people with disabilities, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning people. How can we prioritize and center people in our decision-making? How can we be more responsive to local needs? How can our work build community power and share decision-making? Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing for just a moment. Okay, we have a, a full agenda tonight. But we should uh, proceed with introductions to make sure we all know who's here uh, and know each other. So I'll go around my screen as I see it and call on you for introductions. Um, I'll start with myself. I'm Brian Hawkins. I've been on BPAC since August of 2023. And uh, no, 22? I don't know, a couple of years anyway. Uh, I am the chair for 2024. I also serve on the Development Review Committee, and I am an at-large uh, member representing the city of Durham. Uh, next on my screen, I see John Lawler. Uh, John Lawler. I am uh, a new member. This is my second meeting. Uh, I'm on the Development Review Committee, and I represent the county as the seniority rep. Thank you very much. Jeff. Jeff Bikalchuk, this is my uh, second stint on BPAC. I was on BPAC uh, 2013 through 2016, rejoined in 2023. I'm the liaison to the uh, bond referendum steering committee and the city county bike pedestrian implementation plan committee. Thank you very much. Mary Rose. I'm Maris Fontana. I've been on the commission for about a year. I am the bicycle community representative for the county, and I'm also the Vision Zero liaison. Thank you. Nathan. I'm Nathan Lee. I've been on since last summer. I'm the chair of the planning and policy subcommittee, and I am the Duke liaison. Thank you much. Tony. I'm Tony Reavy. I'm an at-large member for the County of Durham, and um, I'm on the uh, planning committee, and I've been on uh, BPAC since June. Thank you very much. Hannah Salvaggio. Hey, everyone. Hannah Salvaggio. I'm the bike and pedestrian planner with the city and the staff liaison for BPAC. And importantly, for this meeting, keeper of the clock, Treve. Hi, my name is Trevay Willis. I am um, been on BPAC for about, I uh, say, about a month, month and a half, and I am the paratransit and transportation uh, representative for BPAC. Thank you very much. And I believe this is your first meeting of the full commission, correct? Yeah. My first meeting for the full for the, the commission. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Uh, I believe the guest, Peter Whitehead. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm uh, from the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. I'm a commissioner there, and I'm supposed to be the, the liaison uh, to 
BPAC. I guess what Jeff was doing. And then, but now in the reverse. Great. Well, welcome. And I, I think, I think you're it now. I think uh, you show up and do it. You say you're it, you're it. So welcome. Uh, Trent. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Trent Cormier, uh, County at Large member and uh, the newest member of the DevRev committee. So great. Andres. Evening, uh, everyone. I believe you... Andres Otero. Um, oh, wait, Brian, was that for me? I don't know. Oh, I thought I heard my name. I'm so sorry. No, no, I, I called on you. I, I don't know who else was talking. Uh, that was oh, me. Okay, I have okay. a bad connection, so my bad. Okay. No worries. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Andres Otero. I'm a county representative. I've sat on BPAC uh, for uh, close to a year and a half now, and I help run our social media strategy and presence. Wonderful. Thank you. Anna Bartlebaugh. All right. Tech issues. Um, I'm Hannah Bartlebaugh. Joined this last summer, June or July, um, as a county youth advocacy representative, and I'm on the community engagement committee. Thank you. Ed Rizzuto. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Rizzuto. I've been on the commission since 2018, was appointed as the disability advocate uh, by the county, and I serve on the community engagement committee as well. Thank you very much. Chris. I'm Chris Perlstein. Uh, I have a terrible connection, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm also doing my first very remote meeting, uh, and I had to take a lot of buses to get here and have to take some buses to get home. So I may have to leave a little early to not get stranded in carry. Um, I am the city transportation and planning and policy um, uh, position on me. Thanks for toughing it out and joining us, Chris. Uh, finally, uh, Robin Young. Yes, I am Robin Young. I am with the city of Durham in the transportation department. Welcome as always. Okay, I think that's everybody, right? Did I miss anyone? Uh, okay, uh, let's see, we've done that. Uh, excused absences, Hannah. I believe we have two or three, depending on the count. I know Scott and Christian got to you ahead of time, right? Uh, yeah, Scott did. Um, Christian did not. Um, and then who else? I think there was someone else that Landon um, sent me a late breaking message <laughs> that long ago. He's going to try to join halfway through. So Please keep an eye on the waiting room. Okay. If he doesn't join, then that'll just be the absent. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, for excused, it's just Scott. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Do we have uh, any updates on new members and openings? Well, we do have the new member, uh, Trave Willis. Um, he had his orientation and has now been sworn in. So today is his first voting, um, I guess, where he can vote as a member. Um, so welcome, Trave. Um, and then we also still have the vacancies for the youth representative. Um, that one actually the youth who had been appointed um, did a reach back out to the city and they said that they won't be able to be on anymore. Um, so now that position is being, has been reposted. Um, I think that kind of goes back to the conversation of should that be um, an at-large position? Cause we almost made that a while ago. So we'll see, I guess it's gonna be posted um, for, you know, until it gets filled. Um, and then the other one that we're still waiting on someone for appointment is um, Marissa's old position, which is um, the Recreation, Urban Trails, and Greenways. So those are the two. Thank you. So if you know anybody that might be interested in either of those positions, let us know. Um, I, I know we were very close to pulling the trigger on converting that youth position to an at-large position when it was briefly filled. Um, I think maybe we give it another month of an open application and reopen that discussion next month. Mm -hmm. um, 
since it's been kind of a chronically unfilled position. Um, so please uh, reach out to your networks if you know anybody that would like to be involved in BPAC, either as youth rep or as a rep on the uh, trails and uh, trails and greenways uh, seat. Okay, um, moving on. Does anybody have any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Hopefully you've all had a chance to have a look at it. It's got a few items on it tonight. Anything anyone needs to add? Okay, hearing none, we will move ahead with the agenda as planned. Um, the next item then will be to approve the minutes from the September meeting which I hope everybody's had a chance to look at. They're pretty big because they had to consolidate the uh, updates that were provided by committee chairs ahead of time, which thank you everybody for cooperating with that. Um, I hope that facilitated a really good public engagement meeting at the can opener last month. I've heard all good things about that and I'm really sorry to have missed it. Um, with that said, has anybody had a chance to look at the minutes from last month? And if so, uh, do you have any comments or questions on those minutes? Motion to approve is written. Thank you. That was from Tony. I see a second from Jeff. All in favor of approving September minutes as written? Aye. 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 And any in opposition? Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are now moving to the public comment portion of the meeting. Do we have any members of the public that would like to offer comment on anything related to bicycle and pedestrian things in Durham? Okay, hearing none, we can move on from that and get into our business. Okay, let me pull the agenda back up so we can look at this for a second. So can everybody see where we're at? Great. Um, before we get into this, I would just want to mention um, as a point of order, we have a lot to discuss. I think we've allocated enough time to cover it all uh, by not having a guest speaker this week. Um, but I am going to work hard to be very mindful of time. Um, I think some of these we'll have a bit of discussion about. So I'm going to ask everybody to please keep to um, normal order, which is please use the raise your hand function and let me call on you to speak so that we can keep things orderly and we don't talk over each other on Zoom. Um, if you don't have the button to raise your hand or you're having trouble finding it, please just put your camera on and do this. And I will acknowledge you as quickly as I can. Um, and if I uh, need to kind of move you along to get to the next person and move to the next item, please don't take it personally. I'm just trying to get through the agenda in a timely fashion tonight. So with all that said, um, first bit of old business. Uh, we, have, uh, we have speaker lined up for the next November meeting. Uh, thank you, Ed, for running point on that. Looking at December, that slot has not yet been filled it does occur to me we should at least ask are we good to have our december meeting i know sometimes it runs awfully close to some holidays and a lot of people are out of town i think it's relatively early this year though um does anybody know that they cannot make the december meeting for holiday travel or any other re reason if you've been able to look that far ahead on your calendar. Not hearing any comment on that. I'm assuming that we're all good to have the December meeting, which means we should probably plan for it. Um, we've got a kind of running queue of potential speakers and we've gone through a lot of it this year. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about something they'd like to hear about in December, either off of this list or or something else? Nothing at all. This is Ed. I've got an idea. Okay, go for it, Ed. Um, I'll just leave my camera off for now. Um, in connection with the 
the week without driving campaign um, that happened the end of September, early October, um, I signed up for that. And and ahead of it, uh, Bike Durham reached out um, to share about transit training or travel training classes that they were going to host um, ahead of the week without training, just to give people who are used to driving an idea of what options are out there and how to help them figure out bus routes and so on and so forth. Um, and I signed up for the travel training class. Um, and uh, there were a part of that application or registration said, do you have any any uh, special requirements or requests for accommodations? And I, I put in there that I'm, I'm blind and I would like to have the materials that they use for the class in digital format. And it wasn't long after submitting my registration that someone called me. Um, they were really excited about um, possibly tailoring um, the travel training um, for me, given my, my particular circumstances, um, so that uh, we could do an individualized travel training. Um, and I'm, I'm working with them. We're likely going to like I'm going to connect with um, Ashley Scott from Bike Durham, I think next week, and just kind of go over some stuff. And I'm, I know a whole lot of people um, in my community who might be interested in that. So, um, you know, inviting Bike Durham to come and share about their travel training classes and possible individualized travel training program might be of interest. Okay. Uh, that's a solid idea. I see Jeff with his hand raised. Go for it, Jeff. Um, I was just wondering for December on the sidewalk maintenance assessment from Public Works, since the bond issue is going to be voted on in November and hopefully um, passes, I think that would be timely to, and since a, a significant portion of that bond is dedicated to maintenance, I think that might be a timely topic. Okay. All right. I see that down there near the bottom of the list. Okay. Any other thoughts? And by the way, we can also use these ideas into January and February too. We don't have to stop in December. Okay. Uh, let me, let's do this. We, we have a little bit of time. We don't have to settle this tonight. Um, Ed, can I ask you to uh, ask your contact at Bike Durham if they would be interested in speaking at the December meeting or the January meeting, perhaps? And Jeff, do you know who our contact would be on sidewalk maintenance in public works? I don't, but um, we have another bond um, referendum committee meeting on Friday, and there's okay. usually someone from public works there. And okay. if not, I can just find out. I, I bet that's the right path. So yeah, if you could do the kind of the same thing with the same ask, sure. then both of you just get back to me and we'll do one or the other in December and probably do the other one in January. Um, sure. Tasha on. Johnson might be the public works point person on the bond issue for that department. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, anybody have any other thoughts they want to put up there? I think that's two solid ones and we're a month and a half ahead, so I'm feeling good about that. Okay. Going, going, gone. All right. It's time. We've done it several times. We're going to do it one more time, I hope. Let's talk about e-bikes on multi-use paths. Um, I saw a flurry of activity on the working document about an hour before the meeting, so thank you for those that have commented on that, let me pull up. Is this the right one? Yes, it is. Um, so we've had a couple of conversations around this in and out of the main meeting, mostly in the PMP meetings. Um, to recap, the, uh, the issue at hand is that uh, there's a misalignment uh, between Dur Durham's codes is currently written as, as to what vehicles are and are not permitted on multi-use paths, uh, specifically electrically assisted bicycles, which are not currently permitted under Durham code as it's written right now because they are considered motor vehicles. Uh, and the fact that people with e-bikes are in fact using multi-use paths. Um, there's concern that that misalignment is bad in a number of ways. One, it creates ambiguity about what uses are or are not permitted on paths. 
Um, it makes it hard to promote what we think is generally a good alternative to car transportation. Um, we don't want to have a situation of selective enforcement of a law that a lot of people are breaking. Um, and also many of our neighbor communities have already dealt with this issue one way or another. So we wanted to try and encourage the city to look at this, realign definitions, realign the statutes, acknowledging also there's concerns about um, what the impacts of increased use of e-bikes on multi-use paths could be, particularly on pedestrians, people with strollers, people with pets, people who are using mobility assistive devices, um, and wanting to sort of balance those interests. So we have a working draft of a letter that we've had a lot of comments on and a lot of work on. That's on the screen right now. You can also find it and look around at yourself. Let me put this in the chat. Let me pull up the chat. Oh, I can't get that button. There we go. There we go. Okay. So I'll stop talking for a second. Does anybody have any comment they want to raise on this? And I see Jeff's hand first. Go. Um, very quickly, uh, I noticed the footnote about Raleigh and Chapel Hill include uh, electric assisted bicycles. Uh, thus allowing them on their paths. Do we have any information about what their experience, um, have they been experiencing problems with incidents with e-bikes and pedestrians or people on strollers or um, people with limited mo mobility? Um, is this really an issue? I mean, are they having a problem with that? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know about that? Uh, I know I said, if you don't mind yeah, me jumping in go for it right away i i actually do have a little bit of info on this hopefully my audio quality is okay i'm using a new headset here mm -hmm. a little bit of a yeah. noisy environment so i apologize for that um yep. i actually as part of uh, our discussions with the planning and policy uh subcommittee reached out to the town of Cary, who is the most restrictive um recently about e-bike policy and is in the process of permanently making their uh, allowing of e-bikes on greenways um, permanent. Uh, they did it on a trial basis, uh, following some of the similar concerns that have been raised here. And the, the punchline, as as I got it from city staff at in Cary, is that uh, there's a lot of concerns and complaints about bicyclists uh, when they adopted this policy, but not a large number of incidents. In fact, there, I, don't, I don't believe there was any incident that they were aware of uh, where there was a problem. Uh, though I, I will point out that I, I think there's a little bit of a difference in the, uh, and th this is part of my discussion with city staff, a little bit of a difference in the, the population who's uh, more excited about using e-bikes and carry. Uh, and it matches some of my personal experience riding down the American Tobacco Trail when you get down to the lower areas of carry. Uh, what you really see is a lot of, uh, I go through a retirement community essentially to get to my mom's and that's kind of the, the predominant users of e-bikes. It's uh, a little bit of an older crowd that leans more retired or is in some of these 55 plus communities. Uh, and so they did not gather any hard data on usage. And that was something that was very challenging for them. So it was primarily based on just uh, subjective feedback from those who responded to surveys about this, uh, which occasionally were somewhat heated, but uh, were, were not, there was, there was, there was not a lot of issues that they actually saw in terms of, uh, safety incidents that occurred, but there were some points about, you know, were people behaving uh, appropriately as they as they passed uh, those with young children or animals, um, but no major incidents uh, that they were aware of. Uh, and then if I can get to like my personal comment, that, that was just my research with, with the town of Gary. Uh, you know, I, I do think like, I, I understand the, the concern about speeds, but I do think it's important to talk about the specific types of e-bikes that were we're saying are allowed, which are following the state definition of legal e-bikes, which uh, remember are only 20 miles per hour, right? And I think there's a little bit of a misconception about speed. Uh, one thing I, I like to talk to people, and I'm sure some of you guys have heard me bring this up before, but Usain Bolt, when he set a hundred meter uh, record in the Olympics, uh, sprinted at 27 miles an hour. 
right? It's a human sprinting at 27 miles an hour. Um, and that gives you some sense of scale of what people can actually go, right? Uh, the vast majority of humans, even not in the greatest shape, sprint 50 miles an hour. Uh, and, you know, essentially a 50 mile an hour speed limit would mean you could you could keep up with a human sprinting for a short period of time, obviously. Like, I mean, even myself, I could probably do that for like 20 feet before I got tired. Um, so, you know, I, I think the 20 mile an hour limit is, is pretty reasonable. And I will say that like in my personal experience going the, down the American Tobacco Trail, I actually frequently get passed uh, by people on uh, regular bicycles, like road bikes, um, who are pretty kitted out, serious bikers, uh, when I'm going in the range of 15 to 20 miles an hour. Uh, I always try to slow down and be as respectful as possible around uh, animals, children, and even just other pedestrians in general. And I don't see that same behavior always with road bikers uh, who are not even on e-bikes. So I, I'm sympathetic to the concern there, absolutely 100%. Uh, but I also think that this is kind of a broader problem of behavior on shared use paths. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. That's all I got. Thanks, Chris. Before I move on, uh, Jeff, did you finish your thought? Because I know Chris was responding to a question you raised. Um, oh, yeah. Again, I mean, you know, Carrie might not be a great um, example because they're changing their policy. Um, obviously, any information they have would be great. But I mean, if Raleigh and Chapel Hill um, have had this for a while, I would be curious to see have they had incidents, have they had serious incidents, have they had uh, injuries? Um, I imagine if there was fatalities, we would have seen it on the, on the news. Uh, maybe, maybe not. So it may be a case where it's we're, we're looking at theoretical problems, and and I agree with Chris that you know you don't need an e-bike to be going excessive speeds, um, but I would just be really curious: is is this really an issue in practice, or is it just theoretically an issue? Understood. I think it's a fair question. Got a bunch of people with hands raised. I'm going to go to Nathan first. Um, yeah, I just wanted to first answer Jeff's thing. Raleigh is launching an e-bike like um, rebate program to incentivize Raleigh residents to purchase e-bikes by giving them uh, a rebate on them. So I think Raleigh must not be having problems if they're willing to give people money to encourage them to buy e-bikes. Um, and then also to Chris's like speed thing, Mary and I were on the ATT this weekend with my niece on the back of my e-bike, and Mary was on her class one e-bike that can only go up to 20 miles per hour with the motor, and we ran into Landon on the path. We talked to him for a minute, and then we were like, okay, goodbye, we'll probably be way faster than you because we're on e-bikes. And then Landon was able to easily keep up with Mary and continue to have a conversation with her on his just normal road bike. So apparently 20 miles per hour is not very fast, at least not for Landon. Um, so just another point to consider about how fast is 20 miles per hour, really. Um, and then, yeah, that was it. Okay, great. Thanks. Peter. Hey, I just want to say this is something that Dost has also previously, like, talked about because of, of the trails aspect. Uh, obviously, people have suggested that, you know, maybe we want to have a speed limit, things as low as eight miles per hour uh, thrown out. We really ended up nowhere, mainly because uh, we we kept circling back to the idea of if you start putting any any sort of speed limit, it, the only way that that matters is with enforcement. And we were uncomfortable with, there was a, a great discomfort with inviting uh, extra uh, enforcement on the trails, especially given uh, our belief that that enforcement might not always be uh, distributed uh, uh, in uh, equally. Uh, yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that input. That's helpful. Um, I agree. Eight miles per hour is a bit slow. Um, Mary Rose, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I actually asked the people from Oaks and Spokes about this yesterday, um, and whether they had any issues with um, Raleigh allowing e-bikes and. They, I think it might have been some concerns when they were 
bringing it up. Oh my gosh, my alarm is going off. Uh, give me a second. It's 7.30. She has to do her Duolingo. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry about that. It's insanely loud, the alarm. Um, the, so I asked them about it, and they said that they uh, didn't have any issues since allowing e-bikes, but it was something that was brought up prior to allowing e-bikes on trails. Their only issue has been that Raleigh's trails aren't really conducive for trans as a modes of transportation. Like mm -hmm. it is primarily like the routes and everything are primarily for recreation. Um, so that's the only thing that they've had issues with is that like people can't take them anywhere. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else want to chime in on this? Okay. Let me, let me pull up where we're at with the text then. And I would like to make a suggestion that we, I think we've devoted two and a half meetings to this now. I uh, think it's in a place where we should either move forward or drop it. <laughs> so let me, I'm not going to yet read it to everybody. Let me just give an overview because this is still a working document. But we did first draft. We kind of have an introduction here that basically identifies the problem, as as I mentioned, around the code, the definitions of electron of motorized vehicles, et cetera. Um, our identification of potential concerns, some of which we've been discussing, uh, and some of which have also been brought up, um, including safety and also concerns about enforcement. Um, and then this is the important bit. Um, this is where we started talking about recommendations. So to summarize the recommendations as they currently stand, one is to revise city code to allow, explicitly allow electric assisted bicycles by some means. Uh, the second is to set a default speed limit, and currently that speed limit is set at 15 miles per hour. The third is to earmark funds to procure and install ahead of or coincident with the actual change in the statutes, signage that clearly states the speed limit, clearly establishes yield priority, reminds people to be courteous and slow down around other modal users, um, and also where trails go through certain rights of way, um, clearly identifies any zones where electric assist is not permitted. The fourth recommendation, which is new since we last talked about this as a group, and this is my attempt to thread the needle on a couple of concerns raised, was to also ask that they earmark funds to study the impacts of implementation on all modes of trail usage. And that's both in terms of, hey, does allowing this mean more people use e-bikes on trails or not? And also, does that imply we need more capacity on these trails if your usage goes way up? Um, but also to look at impacts on pedestrians, other users, um, by way of making sure we're doing no harm. I'm not personally comfortable with putting a time constraint on that impact study um, for a lot of reasons, but I think that as a general point, it's probably worth including in our recommendations. So I'll remind everybody, this is a letter to council. We're providing advice. We're not writing laws. Anything we do doesn't bind anyone. This is just our consensus uh, idea of what needs to be done. How do we feed feel about this document as it currently stands with that description. Maybe a better question to ask is, is there anybody who really does not like where this sits? I see one thumbs up from Nathan. Thank you. Anybody else? I see a thumbs up from Jeff. Thank you. From Andres. Hi, this is, this is Ed, Brian. Um, I'm- hey, Go ahead. I would be in favor of putting a time limit on the study. I think um, other, otherwise, or some, some. Um, I mean, if, if the study finds that it, there is some sort of negative impact on resulting from, from the introduction or the changes, then, then what happens? And 
you know, my 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 big concern is it's it's going to um diminish or or um you know, just negatively impact the, the use by pedestrians and the people with strollers and people using mobility devices. And and if the, the study reveals that there is that kind of an impact on that, those communities, those users, then, then there should be something to take care of that to um, either go back to the status quo or, or I don't know, I don't, don't necessarily have the answer to that. But um, if we're going to conduct a study, and I think it's important to conduct a study, then um, there should be something to address uh, the outcome of the study that is not a desired outcome or is a negative outcome. Okay, so I hear your concern. Here's here's mine, which goes to a previous conversation we had around this, yeah. which is if we get to we can really get into the weeds of defining what the study should be. So one of the concerns raised previously was around baselining. Like how do we define what usage is now, right? How do we know that what we're seeing is due to an effect? And those are actually pretty complex methodological questions that I don't think this group should decide because we do not have the expertise to do it. So what I'm wondering if we can do, and I'm actually going to maybe tap Carl here for a second since he's the legislator, legislator in the House, is what if we coupled all of this to a, maybe a fifth recommendation that just says, have a trial period, a year, I don't know, I don't know what it needs to be, but have a trial period where impacts assessed under recommendation for are looked at. And, you know, there's there's an automatic sunset. We have to renew this in a year or 18 months or whatever um, following that review period. Does that seem like a workable solution that would give you guys room to maneuver and write a statute that makes sense and is workable? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, first of all, thanks for, for um, wrestling this one down, Brian, and, and all of BPEC. This is really, I think this is a this is the kind of detailed work that matters, you know, the blocking and tackling of city government that really is what makes, makes a difference. So thanks for tackling this. I think what you've got here is a pretty strong statement. I should say also, like, the first point there is an ordinance change. That's a big deal. It's a policy change. The rest of this recommendation is around funding and stuff like that. So it's not exactly making law, right? Um, I think, you know, I think if the committee is comfortable adding language that would say, like, you know, a pilot for a year or two years, whatever the period you is, you might want to suggest, I think would be helpful to sort of to to um, to clarify like the intent of BPAC, right? I think the truth is once this comes back to the city and city staff, they'll have input. Hannah and her team will have input on sort of like, well, what's a workable? Is a you know is a not is a is a two year pilot? Does that make sense? Is that sort of a little bit um, you know are there any challenges with that? So I think the staff probably will will tweak that anyway. But I think putting some kind of like some kind of indication that you'd like to have this work for a period of time and then sort of evaluate. I think that makes sense. And again, I think the city will probably like help us figure out what's the what's the best interval, the most efficient way to do that. Ed, how does that land with you and your concerns? I, I, I like it. I, I think a two year pilot um, makes sense. So just how you just characterized it um, before um, bringing Carl in, and I, I appreciate Carl's take on what's actually going to happen once this is submitted is really helpful. Yeah. Okay. So I just, I literally just added that on. I could probably finesse the language a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we captured it. So, okay. Well, we could do, go ahead, John. Also, there's been a couple of comments in the chat, Brian. Um, if oh, you want to look I haven't at the seen those. Guys, uh, it's going. Like a two year is what sort of folks are saying, which sounds like is alignment with what with what Ed said as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've got a lot of things open on my desktop, and sometimes I lose the chat. Mm -hmm. so thank you for bringing that to me. The only thing that I have concerns on is is D. Uh, clearly identifying sections of trails that are part of the easement specifically requiring bicycles to be powered wholly by the rider. I know that there are 
conditions where items come into the system with that requirement from landowners. But I think that one will be very difficult to uh, to, to really clarify because if uh, I think you'll have a hard time getting uh, folks on e-bikes to turn them off for that section, They're basically going to ignore that. So by reinforcing the signs, uh, adding more signage to it, I don't know that that's going to help that situation. So I'd almost rather kind of like that issue to go away than be quietly forgotten about. But that's really legal. You know, it's going to have to to do something uh, to clarify whether that's important or not. The other the other thing I say is, you know, the the thing about misbehavior. Um, you know, if you look at the way that the police departments draw attention to the speed limits around schools at the beginning of every school year, it's about finding a way to post cars you know, with, with lights near the school for a period of time. And it's kind of like, if you want to try to change behavior on, on the, you know, the folks who are misbehaving, it's about not necessarily posting a signs. It's about how do you do something else, you know, to adjust that behavior. Okay, is it something where you uh, we get some some dedicated people to go spend some time uh, on those trails, looking, you know, talking to people about it uh, uh, to draw attention to it in other ways. So I think there's, I'm, I think this is not a simple thing about just clarifying signs. It's, so. I don't know if that's very clear. No, I I, I hear you. Um, I'm going to go to Mary Rose. Yeah, I was just going to mention that for D, I believe we added this specifically because the current ordinance says the reverse, um, where it's like you're allowed to, I don't remember what the language says specifically, but it's like unless it says you can do it, um, which I believe was referring to like riding with an electric assisted vehicle, um, then you can't do it. So <laughs> this would be like saying the opposite of assuming that you can ride there unless a sign tells you you can't. Okay. I, I believe that was the I, clarification. I, I definitely agree that provision probably is the most muddying of the waters of everything in this letter. Um. I, I wonder if we lose nothing by just being silent on that point and letting the pros figure out the kind of detail. I mean, I'm comfortable with it not being a thing that they earmark funds for. Okay. So that's kind of what it's asking. As yeah, to like update it, is, it is kind of in that section, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got about a minute and a half left on this item, and then we need to move on. Does anybody have any other thoughts? If not, I'm going to raise a propose a plan of action here. Um, you can go, John. Um, there was a comment er made earlier about the e-bikes with a speed up to 20. A lot the pedelics now have a speed of 27 as the maximum support uh, speed. Not that they necessarily achieve that but it, I, I, if we're classifying e-bikes as bicycles then 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 that includes the pedelics as well okay um chris then nathan um yeah i i guess i want to clarify uh briefly i wasn't planning on this but uh you know my my view was we were just be picking back you know hey sorry, piggybacking off the state definition, which is 20 miles per hour. And it's, it's essentially, it doesn't align with the class system, but it's essentially class one and class two, uh, more or less. It's it's not really perfect, but you know, my view is unless we did something different, uh, the state uh, definition of an e-bike not being a motor vehicle would require a uh, assisted speed to 20 miles an hour. So uh, the class three type, uh, pedal X would be considered maybe a motorcycle or some other weird thing. It would it wouldn't fall under the exception where they're allowed. Uh, this the the real thing that I wanted to say is um, 
I actually do support highly the idea of studying these things because I don't think we have enough data on anything other than car usage. Um, and so I'm, I'm very strongly in support of that. I think where I get a little uncomfortable is that, you know, as BPAC, I think our primarily, primary goal should be um, always supporting and encouraging more car-free alternatives. And, you know, for me, I would be much more comfortable with sort of a time-limited thing that said, you know, the reaction to the city needs to be, if there are negative impacts, we've really got to accelerate our investment in infrastructure in non-car-based travel. Um, so things like widening greenways or adding uh, dedicated separated cycle tracks, similar to what's envisioned with the rail trail. So, um, you know, I, I'd encourage everybody here, like there, there's a lot of different types of transit that I think, you know, we all either use more or less, right? I, I don't use the bus as much. I try to use it to, to, to avoid cars, but I still 100% support um, enhancing those things, even if it's something that is a, a mode that I don't use. Um, and so on that front, you know, I would want to know those, those impacts to pedestrians, but I'd want to mitigate that, but I'd want it to be in a way that encourages that use in a, in a safe and effective way. So um, I guess that's my two cents on the outcome of the study, what I would want to see. Okay. Uh, we're one minute over. So Nathan, you get the, well, I get the last word, but Nathan, you get the last word before me. Um, yes. I was going to say what Chris said, that pedelecs are not electric assisted bicycles <clears throat> under North Carolina law, which is the definition that Raleigh and Chapel Hill and Durham are using, which is the state's definition in, um, where is it? It's in uh, GS 2171.1. Um, if you want to look it up. Um, and also the reason why D has made it into here is because I believe the entire justification for not allowing e-bikes currently on the greenways are those easements from some landowners that say powered wholly by the riders. So that was why D had made it in here to do what Mary said, where instead of having it, it's not allowed unless otherwise posted, make it so that it's always allowed unless otherwise posted. So I would say that for our, we can eliminate D entirely from this if we just change our recommendation one to be revise the city code to explicitly allow the use of electric assisted bicycles on shared use paths and greenways in Durham, unless otherwise posted. Because then like they can, we're just, we're basically asking them to, to change what the default is. And we're trying to say, if landowners don't want e-bikes on their portion of the easement, they should enforce that themselves and not ruin everything for everyone else. That's all. Okay. Okay. Um, here's what I'm going to propose we do on this. As I said, we've had extensive discussion. I, I feel like we've hit the high spots and got dangerously close to something that looks like a consensus to me. I will take it as an action to clean up this document uh and get it all resolved to that as i understand it to be this month is your chance if you have anything else you want to comment concern question on please do it on the document the google document you have this month to do it we will do an up or down vote at the next meeting there will not be a discussion at the next meeting so any any further discussion will happen in the google doc does everybody understand that okay Great. We're going to move on Brian, to new business. Then. Brian, there was one last question. I don't know if that, if um, if that's somebody else want to re resolve in the last month, but there's a question from Hannah about who the letter is being sent to. Right now, it's addressed to the city council and the mayor, I think. And that may I'm still new to this process, so I, um, I'm not sure I know the, the the sort of the sort of proper way to do that. It does feel like certainly if you send it to the city council, I will bring this forward to the city manager. I think ultimately it's gonna it's gonna land on the manager's desk, right? So. I think you can, I, actually, I think you should address it to the city council and maybe the mayor. I'll bring it to the manager. Okay. Yeah. I, that's kind of my default. If it's a city policy question, we go to council and let you guys figure out who else needs to be involved. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that. Okay. Thanks. And yeah, sorry guys. I, I can't always attend to the chat. So um, cool. All right. We are moving on to what is next? Ah, new business. Okay. 
open uh, spot on the community engagement committee for a chair. I harassed the attendees of the community engagement meeting last week and hopefully guilted somebody into volunteering. Not everybody that was at that meeting is here, but I will ask, would anybody like to volunteer to be our community engagement chair? Your pitch was compelling. I was waiting to see if anyone else had volunteered before this, but I'm happy to, I'll raise my hand, happy to do it. Wonderful, thank you for volunteering that. I do want to give anybody else the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring if they want to, but I bet nobody's going to. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, congratulations, Hannah. You're the new community engagement chair. Way to step up. You're an example to us all. Getting in and getting your hands dirty right away. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Okay, great. I love it. Let's move on. Next thing we wanted to talk about, uh, kind of a late-breaking thing. We've, we've talked about the bond referendum, specifically the part of the bond referendum. There's actually two bond referenda. Uh, or two questions on the ballot, anyway. Uh, one to do with parks and the other to do with sidewalks and streets. Um, we, I think, want to, though we need to take a vote on it, um, support at least the sidewalks and streets referendum because the projects there are aligned with the kinds of things we've been asking for since time immemorial. Uh, I drafted a very quick and very short letter that says we do that. It's uh, to answer the previous question about to whom it's addressed. I think we decided in which committee was this in? I don't even remember now. Um, one of the committees we decided it should probably be an open letter if we that did was that. Community engagement. Thank you very much, Ed. Community engagement. Sorry, I go to all of them, so they kind of run together. Uh, let me pull up what I've written here. Um, nope. Uh, uh, does everybody now see a Durham BPAC letterhead that starts an open letter to Durham residents? Great. I still know how to use the computer. Okay. Um, before I read this, does anybody have any comments about like the whether we should do this or what we ought to do uh, around that? If not, I would like to read the letter I've written uh, for everybody's edification. So, Brian, I'll voice in favor of the open letter. Um, it makes my job with social media a lot easier so that there's no complication in terms of me posting in favor of the bond referendum, which I'd imagine everyone here is in favor of, um, and then have it be an issue. It's essentially covering all of our bases. Yeah, and thank you for reminding me of that. That is the the actual social media question was what got us to deciding this is probably something we should do. Um, any other thoughts or comments or questions around that? Or anything else related to it? Uh, I see Chris raising his hand, go for it. Yeah, um, I just wanna make one comment uh, and then I'm going to uh, propose that we do vote on it or, or whatever the terminology is formally. Um, the one thing I do want to say is just that, you know, you see a lot of comments online and I, I've tried to kind of engage on my own as in my personal, you know, role uh, supporting this. Um, but there's a lot of people who point out the expense and, and that it's, you know, the five million uh, per mile uh, per sidewalks. And I, I do think that that's a little concerning that that feels like that should be lower and, you know, whatever the city can do to kind of try to find ways to, to get that infrastructure um, done cheaper, faster, better. I mean, I know you can't really pull all levers at once, um, but other than that, uh, you know, I am 100% in support of both bonds. Um, and so I 100% I support this and would like to propose that we, we vote on this. Great, thank you. I, I I probably should read it before I take a motion officially, but I note your support and thank you for it. Uh, Jeff. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Just to quickly address um, Chris's comment, and I've seen a lot of people who have been like, wow, $5 million a mile, this is insane. 
Uh, one thing that we need to keep in mind, not necessarily for the letter, just for everyone's here's edification, is the low-hanging fruit has already been built. The easy sidewalk got built. What this is going to do is this is going to enable the city to build the ones that were really difficult and really expensive, which is why they didn't get built, which is why it's so expensive. So just pointing that out. Got it. Thank you for that uh, perspective. Councilman Rist. Yeah, thanks for Jeffrey. Jeffrey has been one of our um, loyal, uh, he's our VPAC representative to the to the bond steering committee. So I appreciate Jeffrey's engagement and like, yeah, he's been part of it. And I just want to echo his comments um, and give an example. I, you know, uh, we were just re out recently, if you all know East Club Boulevard, east of Roxboro, going out towards um, Dearborn out that way, there's a big chunk of sidewalks that will be built there. And I think as, as many of you may know, if you know that stretch, it's like a lot of roads in Durham where there's like a road and a ditch on either side. So building sidewalks there involves like drainage stuff, retaining walls. It's like not easy stuff. And so Jeffrey's absolutely right. And this is what staff have told us, like the easy ones have been done. And so now we're looking at ones that are more complicated, but like that stretch of each club, there's a lot of folks who are walking down there to get to buses on Roxboro. It's actually really important. So, um, so yeah, we, we have heard those comments and we're trying to be as, um, yeah, sort of respond to that in a, in a, in a, in the most um, compelling way. Cause I think that is, that's where we are. It is. And if you compare our, you know, mile per cost per mile to other cities, it's, it all depends on the situation and so forth. So it's, 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 there's, I know there's some, I've seen some comparisons like, Hey, it should be only about like half a million per mile, but it's all, it's all the context that matters. So thanks for bringing that up, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thank, thanks. I agree. Yeah. That community in general, in particular, it's really challenging and there are a lot of pedestrians, a lot of transit users. I see them all the time. I pass through there quite a lot. Yeah. And the truth is like, if you look at those, those heat maps of where like accidents happen, <laughs> It's a lot of communities like that, sadly. So it's, it is really important. The other thing I will say, just one comment, Brian, is that if it's worth, I don't think you have to do it. Um, yep. But it's worth also adding in the letter that the, you know, much of the, like not all, but a lot of the street stuff is also, there's going to be traffic calming as we, as we repave streets as well. So there's an opportunity, even with the streets, the uh, 30 million for street repaving to also do stuff that's going to be, that's going to support and enhance experience for bikers and walkers. That's a great point because I will say that the letter as written now really focuses on the sidewalk side. Um, yeah, so the, so the streets are, yeah, that's also part of it. Yeah. And I would also just to, to echo what Andre said, like the open letter I think makes a ton of sense because this is this is less about a letter to the city council. We're all working to support this. It's more like this is a public document, right? So yep. I think an open yep. letter makes a lot of sense. Yep, okay, great. If uh, nobody else has any questions or concerns, let me read the letter as it currently stands, and we might take a note to see if we can include Carl's suggestion, because I think that's really good. But let me go ahead and give us a read for the record. Uh, open letter to Durham residents. Dear fellow Durham residents, the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, BPAC, is pleased to offer our support for the Connecting Durham 2024 bond referendum. Specifically, we are endorsing a yes vote on the ballot question regarding a bond order authorizing the issuance of $115 million general obligation streets and sidewalk bonds in the city of Durham, North Carolina. The projects that will be enabled under this funding include long deferred maintenance of existing sidewalks, as well as construction of new ones throughout our community, including extensive repairs in Walltown and in and around NC Central University, as well as new sidewalks along Maureen Road and Duke Street. These improvements are critically needed to improve the safety of our residents. We encourage all residents to look at the referendum's website there's an active link to the website there uh, for complete details of projects to be funded and to either vote early or on November 5th as they are able. Sincerely, et cetera. Uh, I think I would like to uh, edit this with a sentence about traffic calming coincident with road repairs. Other than that, this is pretty much the letter we have. Would anyone like to make a motion? Motion to approve from Andre Sotero. Thank you. Second Andres. this from Chris Perlstein. Thank you, Chris. All in favor, please uh, indicate by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 And aye. Any, any in opposition? Okay, hearing none, we consider this motion approved. Um, I will edit that letter for that discussion with Carl, and I will try to send this out tomorrow. 
Uh, early voting starts on Thursday, folks. Okay, great work. All right, let's see, what's next? Oh, leadership nominations for 2025. Um, I don't really have anything in particular to discuss except to just raise the issue that the time is approaching when we need to elect a new chair and vice chair for next year. Uh, we, we have to do it by December. I would like to suggest that we try to do it next month. Uh, it doesn't change the term of service, but it gives the people who are brought on a little more time for onboarding in advance of hitting the ground running, planning the retreat. Um, so basically, I'm just trying to smooth that transition out a little bit. I wanted to put one thing up on the screen that I had worked on a little bit this afternoon. Uh, this is what I mean when I say I have a lot of windows open. All right. Hopefully, you're seeing a really cool spreadsheet. Yeah? Maybe not quite all of it is visible yet. Yes, we can see it. Great. All right. So this is our membership. As I uh, currently understand it, and if there's any errors, I apologize. Uh, I, I looked at the roster, and I know there's one, at least one mistake in it. Because, um, Tony, it had your term ending in June of this year, and I'm pretty sure that's when you started. So I'm assuming your, your term runs through sometime in 2027. 20, so this, this uh, reflects great. that. Yeah. Um, if you sort of look at down the list here, I've sort of put it in terms of when the various cohorts of city and county appointees terms will expire. I think most people are in their first term uh, and many are actually completing partial terms. Um, but you can kind of see if everybody decides not to come in for a second term, we got a big old wave of people rotating off this summer, uh, 10 in the space of two months. Uh, I don't know who all we're going to retain. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot by asking here tonight, but I really only emphasize this to say, you know, if we look ahead at the terms, and everybody in green is somebody who joined us this summer, by the way. Um, in terms of thinking about leadership roles, and again, I applaud Hannah for uh, setting the standard there. Uh, if you're waiting for some level of seniority or time or tenure on the committee, to step up for that, I will point out that you're you might already be there, or you're closer than you think. <laughs> so, um, with that said, um, I would encourage you all to think about whether you would like to be in the leadership roles. We have happily filled the committee chair today. As far as I know, the two committee other committee chairs are planning to continue on in those roles. Um, actually, Nathan, thumbs up means. That is absolutely true, because Scott already told me that. Uh, I will not continue on as chair of VPAC. It's going to be somebody else's turn. And the vice chair is currently empty. I don't think filling it before the end of the year is a high priority, but it certainly needs to be filled in the new year. So what I will ask, I've already talked to a couple of people. We've had some conversations among current leadership about people that might be nominated. If you have anyone you'd like to nominate, or if you have anyone, or if you would yourself like to consider yourself uh, taking that role, please let me know. Uh, and please don't hesitate to reach out for me if you have any questions about the job, what's involved, the level of time commitment, anything. I'll I'll give you an unvarnished truth, mostly uh, about that. Chris, go ahead. Just a quick question about um, the mechanics of this, uh, as I'm, I'm still fairly new. Uh, do we want to um, make sure that we're considering somebody who has been on this before and it has a term that's expiring next year, who is very serious about re-upping? Um, or do we kind of want to more focus on the folks who are going to serve well past uh, the end of 2025, or at least through the end of 2025? I would, well, as far as mechanics go, there's some language in the interlocal agreement about forming a nominating committee, which I take to mean talking among the officers and also taking suggestions. 
Um, anyone can nominate anyone for these jobs uh, in the normal business of our meeting. Um, that said, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about in terms of the, the questions you raised. I definitely don't think anyone who does not intend to be on BPAC for the full year should be chair of, or co-chair. So if your term is expiring and you want to, you're willing to say, hey, I will go for a second term, I, I believe that's automatic. Yes, questioningly looking at Hannah. No, you have to reapply and you they reapply. Okay. Record, um record whether or not to reappoint you. So I, I'm afraid I might have talked over you a little bit. Could you just say that one more time? Uh, yeah, you have to reapply. And normally, if there is another applicant for that role, um, they'll look at your attendance record to see if um, you should stay on. Okay. Right. I guess my concern then is if we categorically say if your term's expiring, you can't do the job, that takes over half the commission out of contention. I, I mean, there's nothing saying we, we have to do it that way. I'm just saying it would be good to have someone who at least has every intention of serving an entire year. Jeff, go ahead. I think as we've uh, we've learned in the past, especially with Mar Melissa, uh, Marissa, stepping down that um, you know plans change so sure. i think um i think it would be silly to um, not include people whose terms expire next year who plan on um reapplying i i plan on reapplying i'm actually doing a partial term right now so i would have two more terms potentially if i want them after that i just think that would be very short-sighted to um you know eliminate the i don't know 10 people whose terms expire in 2025 um, because many of them are going to re-up. Yep. Um, I am inclined to agree. And again, just to be clear, there's no like prescriptive thing saying someone isn't eligible. We're, we are all eligible, except for me. Well, actually, I'm eligible too, but I'm not going to do it. So, um, I'd also like to note too, so um, we tried to restructure it a bit this past year um, to have it where it was more of a co-chair and chair. So the chair wasn't having to do everything. And I think that really led to a lot of that burnout previously. Um, and so it's it's not where you would be doing everything. Um, so if you are a little nervous about that, um, yeah, just know that you would be supported and we would want to make sure that the co-chair is able to kind of help fill in some of those pieces too. Because, I mean, Brian, you know, Marissa was a really great help. She was able to, you know, uh, lead some of these meetings and she was doing quite a bit on the back end too. So don't be afraid that like the chair is like this huge responsibility because it it is, you're the face, but um, at the end of the day, you still have a lot of support. So I Absolutely. I will completely echo that. I want to credit Marissa with being a tremendous help this year. Uh, I hated to see her go, but as Jeff said, plans change, and I understand that completely. Um, and yeah, I, I couldn't have done that job, this job, uh, without her support and also support of others who've stepped in when I needed. Like, I made it really clear the odds of me being at every meeting were very low, and that turned out to be exactly true. Um, but I think we've we've weathered it fine, and I, I would certainly encourage anyone who takes on this job um, to also lean heavily on the people around you to support. It's, it should not be a singular position. Uh, let me just make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. Ryan, if I could just, one thing that's related to this is not quite on topic, but I just want to throw this out there since we're talking about sure. leadership and also membership of BVAC. So we did have a discussion actually just last week with, uh, um, with a city clerk about the issue of you know, when nominations come to the council, sometimes they come with a recommendation from that committee like BPAC or others, sometimes they don't. So so right now is when folks apply to be on BPAC, I don't think you have any visibility of that, right? Or the or the or BPAC when those not, things not, are posted. Not not unless somebody asks. Yeah. So I think so if the and this is maybe worth a separate discussion. If BPAC were to want that ability to have some you know, ability to be candidates. I think it would involve a change in the bylaws that have to be uh, worked out through, with the city attorney who'd be glad to do it. But it, I think it does 
if it's in the bylaws and the city clerk does it, if it's not, she doesn't, you know. So is that a is that a question of whether we would need to change our bylaws to get that? I mean, I think or it's probably more a question for BPAC. Like, do you all do you all want that that ability to get because it for me as a, as a council member, it's always good to know what the you know, I don't always go with the committee, but it's always good to know what the board or commission what they want because typically you're out there recruiting people, so it's good to know that. Um, but I think it's a question of you all want that. And then actually, if you all decide you want it, I'm happy to work with the city attorney to make that happen. But it's more a question of like, you know, what you're as a as a committee want to do. Yeah. I I I but don't decide that. I just want to throw it out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a um not terrible idea, but anybody else want to sound off on that while we're briefly on this? I thought it was a really difficult process to update the bylaws. Um so that's why I kind of held back on wanting to pursue that. I mean, look, so I don't know, I haven't been through that process. When we were talking to the clerks, it didn't sound like it was a like a huge big deal. And again, I'd be happy to sort of, you know, work with the city attorney to make that happen. It's got to be a pretty small change. And I'm sure it would come for a vote at some point, but it's probably not. A, I don't think it should be a big deal, especially if BPAC wants the change. And I would support that. Jeff? Um, two quick things on this. Um, it would require both the city attorney and the county attorney, since we're uh, both the city and county members. Um, I served on DOS for six years, 2010 to 2016. And in those days, um, I don't know if it was in DOS bylaws, but every time there was an opening, um, DOS actually got copies of the applications and it was something where we often made recommendations on a specific person and the feedback i remember receiving from council members was obviously was different council members back then um, was that it was very positive that they found it very helpful that we were um, vetting people or giving recommendations on who we thought would be a good fit were the applications reviewed during the general DOS meetings or? Uh, they, they were, um, I don't, you know, it's been eight to 10 years. Um, I believe that they were reviewed during the um, during the main DOS meetings, uh, might've been during a committee meeting also. Okay. I, um, I, I, I'm gonna make one comment and I think we probably need to move on. Uh, I. One of the things I kind of have in my mental queue for when I'm not chair of this commission anymore, but still a member of it, is to maybe get a little working group together about looking at our bylaws and asking what quest what if any changes we might want to ask for um, to make things run smoothlier. Um, and this could definitely be one of them. I because I I agree it would be cool to do it. It would also be cool if it was like actually officially part of the process and not ad hoc, um, mostly I think in the interest of fairness. So um, I I think maybe we can take that as an action for further discussion and maybe a slightly larger discussion about if we're gonna bug the city and county attorneys about this, maybe we should try to bundle a few asks into one um, to that end. Cause I, I, I think it's probably a time has elapsed where maybe taking a look at some of those details is would be timely. So I will add that to the queue and thanks for bringing it up. So uh, anyway, um, if you would also like to think about these things and uh, help set the strategic direction for BPAC, consider being chair or vice chair next year. Uh, and I'll be probably talking to some of you individually soon. So um, let's move on to the thing I actually wanted to spend this meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter, I just saw your hand. Go ahead, please. Oh, no worries. I just wanted to quickly uh, comment on what Jeff said. At DOS meetings in my two years here, we have never uh, reviewed um, applicants or uh, anyone for open positions in general meetings or in uh, in committee meetings. So that must be something, I don't know if it's in our bylaws that we don't do that, but it's not something we've been doing for the last couple of years. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to at least start the process in this meeting of discussing what we should ask for in the CIP budget next year. Um, you may recall, because it actually wasn't that long ago and that was the problem, we had to do a kind of quick hurry up uh, to get things in in a timely fashion. So I'd like to start the discussion today. Um, and I have been bugging committee chairs about this as well. 
at a very high level, what do you think our priorities should be? And I'll kick off with the discussion we've had about um, maybe requesting some funding to support transportation, being able to uh, develop some new design details that align with a lot of the things we've been asking for in DevRev, um, particularly around multi-use paths, uh, but also how they cross intersections. There's, there's a lot of design details that don't really um, that aren't in the portfolio uh, for the city and county of Durham right now, and it would be very helpful when we make those asks to have something to reference. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, I, as I understand it, the bandwidth in transportation is such that they would almost certainly have to engage a consultant to do that. So therefore, there's money to be attached to that. So that's an example of a request we might make. Um, Hannah, is that a pretty good summation of our discussion so far? I think so, yeah. Okay, great. So what else? What else have y'all been thinking about? Go ahead, Nathan. Um, just personal prep pet things that I would like would be to upgrade all curb cuts on the ATT. There's a few, like when you're heading north down that are nice, that are like nice and like totally flat and aren't just like the weird scoop down like narrow thing, but they're like all the way flat. Uh, having all of the curb cuts be that would be great. And I don't know, that's not that expensive to do, hopefully. Uh, the other idea I have is to kick NCDOT out of downtown, meaning acquire all of the streets and roads downtown, take over maintenance of them and just be like, your priorities are nonsense. And so we don't want you to have a say here anymore. Good day to you. You can deal with the outskirts. Acquire and, all NCDOT streets downtown. Okay, got it. Ideally, it would be the entire city, but we can start with downtown, do that really well, and be like, see how this is better? Do you guys want to spend more money to make it better everywhere? And we can do it that way. Okay. I I like that. Uh, okay. We're going to go Tony, Chris, Mary Rose. Tony, go ahead. Yeah, so just a, um, a quick point. I don't really have a reference for the budgeting process. In other words... You know, do do we have a budget sheet for the last full year? Do we have a budget sheet for this year? Uh, what is the process? And then, I mean, one of the expenses that was just mentioned would be in the multiple millions of dollars. I mean, what's reasonable to request? Um, you know, I don't really have a referent for how we budget and what part of the city budget we cover and how much... Yeah we might be able to request. So so here's the great news. We don't write the budget. <laughs> this is just basically BPAC communicating its priorities to the people who do, who are elected. Um, so it's think of it as a, as a wish list, but hopefully one with some specificity and detail to it. Oh, okay. And it being multi millions of dollars is fine. Hmm, okay. Interesting budget process, but okay. yeah, I mean they can say no, <laughs> but we can we can and I think should ask for things that we think reflect our priorities and our values. Um, actually, I, I am going to skip ahead. Carl, did you want to comment on that directly? I do want on just on that one. Thanks for the question, Tony. Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. I should say for, also for the folks who don't know. So timing wise, like the city now, like staff wise starting to kick off the process right now on the staff end right um that process then when the and they're starting to do community engagement on the budget usually then sort of when the calendar turns to the next year is when we start having budget meetings with electeds and kind of go deeper but the process is starting now i would say there's there's no perfect answer to your question um and i you know on the one hand i like the sort of like you know just sort of like big picture just kind of you know throw everything in the in the in the in the in on the list I would say it's probably, you know, because we'll, the letter will come to us essentially, and then it'll be on the member, on, the, on council members to advocate for this as part of the budget process. And I think the manager as well. Um, I think, you know, coming in with like 25 recommendations is probably going to be a little bit confusing to folks. I would say like, you know, identifying three to five high priority, you know, asks will probably get more likely to get attention and maybe get success than a whole long list of, you know, everything. So. I think strategically, there's probably a way to communicate this better than other ways. Yeah. 
I yeah, think last year. Yeah, no rules. That's it's all it's, it's wide open. I, I think last year we ended up with about half a dozen. Um, and we also partially because of timing, but also for strategic reasons, we aligned our recs substantially with what we saw coming out of the Department of Transportation that we liked, i.e. all their bike and bed stuff, um, and also to some extent with Bike Durham. So it's sort of adding our voices behind things that other stakeholders had identified as high priority to just really say, hey, yeah, let's get behind these. So, and I think we should, we should do that as well, but I also want to be a little more proactive this time about asking for what we want. Um, but I, I do, I, I would like to see us get down to a pretty focused list. Um, and we have a little time to do that. So Chris, then Mary Rose. Yeah. So I kind of want to, um, second what Nathan said, but also from the perspective of like, I, I don't know really how to wordsmith this, but I, I do think we should encourage the city to uh, think more broadly about the expense of some of these things, right? If NCDOT is willing to give us the street for free, uh, my understanding is the primary residence is public works is still on the hook for, you know, repaving after whatever the last time that NCDOT repaves is. And that that's not nothing. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I understand public works. Public works is hesitance with that, but we also maybe aren't really thinking about the broader expenses that the city's incurring um, in terms of, you know, when there's, when NCDOT sort of says, oh, we're going to have too, too many lanes that are too wide going in one direction. We've seen the outcomes with businesses being smashed into, homes being smashed into, um, and then obviously the, the injuries and loss of life. And those things are not free to our community. And I, I sometimes wonder if we're doing a good job of even making a good faith effort at, at kind of really accounting for uh, those expenses uh, relative to the the repaving cost, especially when we could sit there and, and make a street calmer and perhaps uh, put it on a road diet. Uh, the other thing that's kind of also related to that is, and, and ties back to our e-bike policy discussion, is really trying to find a way to um, better evaluate multimodal uh, demand and potential in our in our network um, I don't really know what that would look like, but I found out recently that the um, counters on the American Tobacco Trail are no longer functional. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, we we put a lot of time, money, and effort, uh, relatively anyway, uh, into measuring um, car demand. Um, I'm I'm not sure how good of a job we're doing that with other things. That's all I got. Thanks. Those are all great points. Mary Rose. I was going to piggyback off of the first thing that Nathan said about the curb cuts for the trails um, and that I believe these are specifically not ADA compliant, um, the ones that he's re he was referring to. So making sure that all of the um, intersections with at least the ATT, and I'm pretty sure uh, the other trails have this issue too, where the some of the curb cuts are not ADA compliant. And I've put in one call request for them and they just kind of get ignored. So, okay. um, yeah. All right. Uh, great, John. Okay. So one of the things that uh, I've talked to a few of you about is uh, the opportunity to uh, get smart bike racks in positions around the town. And I don't know if it's too early to talk about that in terms of asking for it as a budget budget item, but smart bike racks have the potential to completely drop bike thefts to, to almost zero uh, and scooter thefts to almost zero. And uh, it's it's the, the only challenge is very few people know about them at this point, but it's something that's starting to explode in terms of, of the expansion. Uh, New York City just put out a tender for 500 clusters of smart bike racks. Um, and so things, uh, what, Reagan Airport just added them uh, for their employees as well as for transit customers. Uh, so they're... There's something that has the potential to double the interest in people becoming lifestyle riders because they don't have to worry about whether the bike they have is 
uh, going to be stolen or not, because it's almost impossible to steal from a smart bike rack. And if you take a look at the inventory of bikes that are on the U racks today, they're bikes that people are willing to risk because they have heard too many experiences of bikes that have been stolen or they've had a personal experience of a bike that's been stolen or parts stolen off. And I know I don't want to make the entire pitch tonight because some of you don't know anything about them, but it would be easy to bring you up to speed on it. But it's, it will take a, probably a little bit of time to get a larger group enthusi about, enthusiastic about it. Um, it's just, you know, with Vision Zero, you know, uh, putting a lot of emphasis on focus, you know, doing something else that is kind of parallel, not that saves lives, but really makes the process of being a lifestyle rider much more interesting, okay? Because you've got a safe place to park your bike. And um, I'd kind of like to see us start talking about that, whether it goes in for this year's budget recommendations or not. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's appropriate. I, we're ideating right now. I love it as a bullet point to talk about more. Uh, let's go to Treve, who I believe had his hand up, and then Tony. Hey, how's it going? Um, Good. I this is my first meeting, so I don't want to sound, you know, crazy or anything. And I haven't had a chance really in my new role to really get around and talk to a lot of people about the concerns by being in transportation liaison. But I know most cities have this problem, and that is vandalism and issues with the bus stop shelters. Um, that's one of my concerns there. I, I, I think this falls up under our, our scope. Um, but I noticed that, uh, you know, I travel around Durham, you know, quite a bit and I've seen some, you know, old dilapidated, uh, you know, bus stop shelters and seats that's been worn and things to that nature. So by being a, tra a transportation guy in general, um, I felt like that pretty much would be a concern that I would address and, uh, see how far we can get with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bus stop shelters, new and improved. I, I think it's a great, great bullet point for this list. Thank you. Um, Tony. Yeah, just one other question about the process. So we're, we're planning to coordinate, correct me if I'm wrong, we're planning to coordinate something like five or six priority requests for the, the agenda says for the 2025 budget. What, wouldn't that, so what we're preparing this for is for the city and county fiscal 2025, 2026 budget, is that correct? Is the, yeah. are the city and the county on the same budget cycle as the state? I assume, so probably the city formally starts preparing its budget in February, perhaps? I mean, that's what the state does. So um, do by when would we need to submit this and who do we submit it to? So just a couple of things that if I can jump in right here. So oh. it is actually, I think Tony's probably right. I think it is the fiscal year 26 budget, right? That would be approved okay. in July. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good point. Um, I think, again, I think you should submit this to the council and the city manager. Um, that'll get it in the right channels. And then I would like, I would say, you know, as soon after the new year as possible, I think getting it in, because, they'll, you know, a lot of folks will be getting their ideas in, so the sooner the better, but, it, you know, if it comes in, in, you know, February, it's also like, it's not going to be ignored. So, but I think the sooner you can just to get in a queue is always good. That, that, just it out. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, our letter from last year, which I'll put a link to in the chat, um, was dated February 29th, and we definitely felt that we were under the wire probably should have yeah, been that's sooner. probably a bit too yeah. late yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's why we're talking about it now <laughs> so cool um anything else i think we've got a great list to get started here folks this is awesome landon go ahead um on this budget request since we're making this to the city and the county are there would it be useful and or more impactful for us to ask 
to, to write it, it, this comes in the form of letters, correct? Yeah. Okay. Would it make more sense to address things to the city that are, that, that are focused on the city and then write two letters? And then, because if we're addressing budgetary priorities to the County, um, my suggestion to the County would be do everything that you can to advance the construction and land acquisition and or everything with this, you know, Roxburgh rail trail thing as a regional pedestrian bicycle transit connector. I, I, you know, I know that there's not, there are some go triangle, go Durham routes that go out into the County, but you know, that's few and far between. And, uh, you know, when we get our updates from, County commissioners is not really normally a a big update there as opposed to you know what what's going on in the city and I cannot think of anything that would be more impactful as far as encouraging non automobile transportation than something that's connecting our region to a different one and a lot of that land that needs to be acquired and whatever needs to be done it happens in the county so if we're gonna put in that i i I, I would suggest that for the county specifically, that should be an at least an ask, if not the ask. I I there there is no reason we cannot also send a letter to the county, and I think that's it, a very good reason to do so. It certainly makes sense to me to do that be, to multiply our potential funding streams. You know, they, they, it, Landon, it's a great it's a great suggestion. You're right. Like customizing that to the city and county makes a lot of sense. I will say on that on that in that regard. So. The, it's, I think you probably are, a lot of you probably don't know this. I'm probably telling you something you don't know or don't already know, but the a large chunk of the funds for transit are in the on the Durham County side, right? Because we pay transit tax. So a lot of the money is there. Um, but as you noted, a lot of the sort of like the actual execution of stuff, like running the bus systems and so forth, um, you know, building sidewalks and so forth is on the city side and on, on our public works and transportation side. So, so hitting both of those is actually really important. So the bus shelter point could go to the county as well, then probably. Um, that's and then there's ones like that's probably both. That's probably okay. both. We can put it to both. We can write as many letters as we care to, or and it's easy for me to say because it'll be the next chair's job. So <laughs> <laughs> also though to that point, oh, so chair I mean, chat GPT. <laughs> it seems like a lot of action is writing letters, but Carl, what would you recommend? Is writing a letter the most impactful way to get this message through? Or do you think a PowerPoint or, um, yeah, how would you suggest, especially since this is going to be, um, yeah, just at the time that it actually comes through? Um, what would be the most impactful? I, I, think, I mean, I think a letter, that, that's a form, at least, you know, I've been to this only once, so this is my you've got a second time going through it, but, you know, we just got a bunch of letters last year from different groups. So I think a letter, probably like, you know, two page letter. Okay. And uh, particularly for the new members, but for everybody's reference, I put last year's letter in the chat, if you want to take a look at it. And again, that shouldn't be considered prescriptive. We did that in a hurry. And my whole point in bringing this up soon is I'd like to do better this year. So um, have a look at that at your time. What I will do, I've got some, I, thank you all, first of all, this is great ideation. I will capture everything here into a document. I'll put it in the drive and send a link around and we can make that our working document for bullet points. Um, and then let's aim for some serious discussion on this. If not next month, certainly in December um, so that we're actually putting those letters out in January at the latest. Um, that would be my goal um, and hopefully make the next person's job a little easier on that front too. Thanks y'all. I really appreciate this discussion. I think this is great. Last item of new business, we are just a little behind, but I think we'll make it up um, through the reports. Uh, Hannah wanted to talk about the annual report. Yeah, it was mostly just a quick shout um, to you, Brian, and then Scott and Nathan. Um, and then I guess, yeah, if anyone else has any thoughts. Um, but so we have to do the annual report that's typically due in January. Um, I think it's our deadline is the middle of January, end of January. Um, and so the structure for that is giving all of the updates for all of the committees, the different committees, and then also um, 
you know, having the attendance in there and some of the, the other higher level things. Um, since we have had several different chairs for the um, community engagement now called uh, committee, that one I'm willing to help with Brian on. Um, but for the planning and policy one and for development review, um, Nate and Scott, if you all could really help kind of do all of those updates. Um, I'll reach out to y'all about it, but um, yeah, we'll kind of have a, a working document of some sort. Because last year it was also a, it was rushing around having to do it all um, really quickly. So would like to start on that soon. And then Brian also before you pop off and no longer are sitting in this role, definitely want your help, so. I, I promise I won't leave you high and dry on the annual report, even if it means I'm working on it in January. Okay, okay. Hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will also work to get as much of it done before January as possible for the same reason. So um, should we plan, should the four of us you just mentioned have maybe a call sometime soon to like try to make a plan, set some expectations and timelines around that internally? Sure. Okay. I'll I'll send a doodle poll or something around and let's find a time to talk okay. in the next few weeks. Um, because it'll take a little time. But thank you for elevating that. Okay. Great. Thank you all for that great discussion. We're not too, too far behind, but we need to go to our committee and liaison reports. We will start with our liaison from the Durham City Council, Carl. Lord Thanks, George. Brian. Yeah, so I've got a couple things, but I'll try to be real succinct, but a lot going on. Um, so the, the first thing is, big update, is it, as probably you can imagine, and we talked about it earlier on this call, we're doing a lot of work to advocate for the November bond referendum. And so appreciate all the work the folks on this call are doing, uh, including Jeffrey, who's on the, the, um, the steering committee for the bond. Um, you may have seen the yard signs that are out around town. Um, we've got yard signs. They're, they're all around town. I want to give a big shout out to Bike Durham, who did a lot of the legwork in putting those signs out. So it's really good to get those out early and to, to get the visibility. There are going to be some palm cards, I think, we're going to be developing to hand out maybe at polls and elsewhere. So those will be coming. They'll be branded similarly to the um, to the yard signs. And also, she give a big shout out to the chamber. It's done a lot of the work to um, organize us and also got some businesses to kick in funding to pay for like the yard signs and the palm cards. And then there will be also social media work coming up. So look for that. Um, also, shout out to Bike Durham. I know Mary Rose was there yesterday at their Bikeable City event, right? So Bike Durham did a 10-mile bike ride um, through a bunch of neighborhoods that stand to benefit from the bond. So it was really a cool idea to, to both have a, you know, bikeable active thing for folks to do to really learn more about the bonds. It was a great event. I really want to congratulate them for doing that. Um, the second thing is, oh, Trevay, to your comment, okay? So... Uh, at the upcoming city council meeting, not this Monday, or no, it's next Monday, we will be approving a contract for an additional 60 new bus shelters. So that's an ongoing an ongoing um, uh, commitment, an ongoing sort of uh, priority for the city. So six new shelters, that'll, some of those are to replace, you know, those old metal walled shelters that are out there. We're going to replace a lot of those and then also replace some of the ones that have just been sort of like have been torn up or kind of are now in not good repair. But 60 new um bus shelters really cool stuff that's awesome yeah yeah a need like that and then the other thing we will do on monday next monday where was it here um is we are gonna we'll have that nacto resolution that we've been talking about that will be on, on the formal agenda to adopt nate baker's done a good job of sort of taking that initial draft working with folks hannah's colleagues in transportation but also the public works folks i know it's a tricky thing to sort of you know we're trying to change change kind of you know how things are done and so change is always a little bit difficult but he's done a good job of working with some of the key departments who really are the ones you know we can issue a resolution but ultimately it involves people in the city who will then take action to do that so um that should pass on, on monday the 21st so that's a good piece of um of progress and in some ways some of the stuff you were talking about brian about like streets cross sections some of that is in that nacto guidelines to sort of change how we you know what the defaults are for how we design our streets widths and so forth. So that's really important stuff. Um, I do want to say also the third thing, um, DevRev can need to do a great job. We love the comments and all the zoning cases we have. 
And I should say that um, we are meeting next, I'm meeting with Scott and a developer next Wednesday. There's one developer, I think we may have talked about this at our last meeting, there's one developer for one of these um, converting like short term stay hotels to like to actual um, apartments who's not been very responsive to BPAC comments. This is, I think, I think it's a hotel that was at the corner of, I think Landon probably like this one. This is like 54, 55, right? Wasn't really responsive. So like we got a call with Scott, the, a, a, a person who's on the development team and myself just to talk through like, hey, like here are the comments we had from BPAC, like what's up with that? So to have a conversation with the developer. So I think it's a good model of how we can leverage some of the comments you're making and make sure we we get, you know, if there's, if there's a, questions you all have or sort of feeling like you're not getting a response, we can sort of you know bring people together. So I think it's a good model of, of a BPAC working with me and, and other folks to kind of to get some of the answers we want and hopefully to get the success we want and the, and the results we want. Um, the last thing I'll say is, and this this relates in part to um, to Nathan's comments about like just taking over like ownership of these state run state owned roads in the city. So I do want to let you know just to sort of like the kind of current update on the Roxborough Mangum uh, two-way conversion. So um, the latest is that the city has um, done all that it's got to do on the planning side to get to sort of move the process along. Um, Sean Egan, the director of transportation, told me that they're they're now at transportation, like ready to do the design process, but they submitted what they needed to submit the DOT to sort of get them to say, yeah, go ahead with the design process. And DOT, and, and Hannah, if you have more details, correct me if I'm, if I'm, Missing any details, let me know if you want to add anything to this. But essentially, DOT said, like, uh, yeah, we're not sure, you know. They didn't say no, but they didn't say, like, yeah, go for it. They're just like, we're not sure, you know. So that's not good news. And so we've been essentially trying to, like, expedite this issue. I sent a message today to um, Lisa Mathis, who's the – we're in Division 5 for the state uh, – states, divisions in DOT. Sent a letter today to, to Lisa Mathis, who's our Division 5 representative on the board, to say, hey – like we're not asking for money from the state. We just want you all to sort of like let this move along, you know. Um, we're also talking to the state legislative delegation, in particular Burnett Alston and um, Zach Hawkins, who work more closely with DOT to say like, is there something we can do to get higher ups just to sort of understand that we're, again, it's, we're not asking for money. We just want to get them to approve us moving forward. So we're trying to leverage as much as we can to get DOT. I know it's not their biggest priority. They got like obviously a lot of, um, a lot of lot to deal with in Western North Carolina, but we're just trying to get them to like just get out of the way. So it's not easy, but we're but part of what I want to do is just kind of stay on this so we don't get behind the 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 schedule we've set. So that's where we are right now. We've got five hundred thousand dollars in the CIP this year to do that design work. So we're like prepared to like issue a contract and get going. But we, as Sean Egan said, like he doesn't want to bring a contract to the city if DOT is not sure they want to let to do the work. So. We're a little bit, that's what that's why we're at this point. So we're trying to get that unstuck with DOT. So I wish Thank it were I wish it were easier. You're probably not surprised about this, but I know this is a huge priority for the local citizens of Durham. And I know this is like we want to do this one first and then get to Duke Gregson or uh yeah, Duke Gregson next. So this is a uh, this is a, important to me and I'm gonna stay on this, but it's um it'll take some work to like to make it happen. Hey, thank you for that update. I really appreciate that. I know this group appreciates that and the, the work y'all are doing to keep the ball sure. moving. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. Um, great. I think uh, I'm going to move this along. If we could go to our other liaison reports, uh, we'll start with Duke. Uh, Nathan, anything to report from Duke? Yes. An alternative transportation working group has now been created. Um, it... It lives kind of under sustainability operations in the Office of Climate and Sustainability. Um, and so we're meeting November 6th as our first official meeting as being an official entity, I believe. So, yes, uh, Trevay. There you go. Now, uh, what is this group again, you say, the presentation? For Duke University, it's an altered, alt alternative transportation working group to try to get Duke to be less car dependent and to try to get them to invest in better bus stuff, better biking stuff, um, better accessibility on campus, stuff like that. How could I be part of that or do I not qualify? 
If you're a, a Duke person, I think you qualify, yeah. I can I can tr probably get you added to that if you want. Okay, yeah. Um, I would it's, you, yeah, it's got that. university and health system staff. There's at least one student on there. There's a bunch of different people from all over the university. So, I can... so, so you would have to be a Duke student or employee? Yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Hey Nathan, on that one, are you? Do you also have folks from like planning that are involved in that as well? Not yet, because it's worth it's worth um, seeing if someone from the planning side would be would be willing to be part of that. I'm only thinking about this new rezoning we just gave Duke for the central campus, you know, which mm -hmm. gives them broad authority to design the central campus. And we talked a lot about like with that rezoning, like you know, um, environmental kind of like sort of the sustainability plans for Duke. Um, design standards and that kind of stuff. We didn't really, I mean, we talked a little bit about transportation, but it would be good to have someone on the planning side because that's because, like, making sure that that connects to the stuff in the city as well as what's happening at Duke would be would be very important. Yeah, I I guess I'll bring that up because I have no idea who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure somebody <laughs> in there would know. Yeah, so. Yeah. The problem with a lot of things at Duke is that everything is like really siloed and set apart and so like i have no idea who to ask <laughs> about anything for the most part it's just like things happen and it's like who did this and people don't know but i will i'll write that down um that's it for duke great well, that's a good update thank you um royal's not here to talk about nccu so that'll get us to oh landon go what's up Sorry, dealing with an iPad. I'm traveling for work, so this is I don't have my normal setup. Um, yeah, there, there's been a decent amount of discussion in the group chat about the NCCU Fayetteville Street Corridor, and I want to make a couple points on this. Um, so I live four houses up from everyone's favorite intersection with of the American Tobacco Trail and Fayetteville Street. Um. There is, and I use, utilize the tobacco trail as my main form of non-automotive -automo commute. I meet clients in downtown. I go to downtown to patronize businesses, and I use it for recreation. And when I am bringing people, when my friends or family come to Durham, th this is the gateway into and out of the city for me, the American Tobacco Trail is. Um recently within the last like three weeks that that intersection has always been a problem i recognize that but recently within the last three weeks there has been established on directly adjacent to the trail a new um encampment there and since that time um there have and again i use this all the time so you know if you want to come see this with me come on um, urine, feces, rats in that area. Um, there is also, um, you know, I, I take, I take the trail at night. I'm that guy. And at night there are huge bonfires right on the trail, not directly on the pavement, but right beside it from this encampment. And I know that it has been mentioned in the chat how DOST has um, declined to advocate for more patrolling because of fears of whatever. But a former DOST member, Tanya McRae, which is my next door neighbor, was one car behind a drive by an exchange of gunfire. Which, as we know in this city, when those things happen, innocent people sometimes get caught in it. So a former DOS member was quite nearly almost, you know, some bad things almost happened there. That was about two weeks ago. Um, I know there's a fine line to add to walk between, you know, being compassionate and caring for public safety. But when people are getting shot at, 
and that particular area of the trail becomes borderline unusable, I think that there might need to be intervention outside of just putting in Durham one call requests, which a lot of the people in my community, part of my little silo of Durham, have done. And just for reference, that one intersection, now this all of this stuff has been recent, but since I've since I've gone there, I moved in December 2019, three murders in that area. So that's what we're living in off Fayetteville Street right there. And it's directly impacting the main north south pedestrian bicycle thoroughfare. So I don't know who or or what we can do to advocate for this. I know this is a DOS issue as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's become a problem and it's not getting worse getting better, it's getting worse, especially with this new encampment that has been established. So I wanted to voice those concerns and I wanted to humbly say that at a certain point, safety outweighs other things uh, or other um, inclinations that people might have because uh, I, I understand compassion, but when you're falling asleep to the sweet sound of gunfire frequently, patience wears thin. That's all I got. Just wanted to make some points. Understood. I understand this is timely, potentially. I also don't think we have time to really discuss it. Unpack it. Yeah. No, that's there's a lot in there, but this has been this has been something that has really come to a head over the last three, three-ish, three, three, four weeks. So uh, I am echoing community comments from myself and yeah. people who live in that community. So and I know that there was a point made in our September meeting that Durham wants to hear from people. If you would like me to bring other people from that community to make to echo these comments, I'm happy to do so. And maybe okay. maybe the city council is the place to make this comments. But I just wanted to raise it because this is a pedestrian and bicycle issue. So, yeah, I, I think that's fair. I certainly have no problem. I mean, we are a forum for public comment as well. Sometimes people come, sometimes they don't, but that's entirely appropriate to raise that here. And thank you for elevating this issue. If you want to bring people to the next meeting, I have no problem with that. If we want to have this as a discussion item on the next meeting, I have no problem doing that as well. Um, I, but yeah, we don't we don't really have time to unpack it tonight. But this is complete, this is complete news to me, and I just caught up with the chat while you were talking. So, you know, thank you for caring. Happy to show anyone who wants to come with me to Fayetteville Street. Okay. Um, there's also, part, if I can say, what real quick, Brian, there's also, Landon, as you probably know, before every work session, there's a public comment period. You don't have to have an agenda item. You can just kind of come and speak about whatever you want to. So certainly coming to a work session and sharing that would be a, a very important way of like. I, I, can, I can come correct with several members of my neighborhood. Thanks. In, sorry, including, sorry. The former, in, including the former DOS member. Yeah, super. And, and so sorry about that. It's yeah. Not fun. Yeah. Sucks. Before I move on, I think we're going to need a little extra time on this meeting. Can I get a motion for maybe an extra 10? I'm I'll make Landon. a motion for an, for an extra 10 minutes. Sorry that I blew it up. That's okay. I was going to have to ask for it anyway. Second. Seconded by Mary Rose, um, which I'm mostly saying because I think our minutes taker is gone. So I want to make sure it's on the recording. Uh, all in favor of adding 10 minutes to this meeting, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Are there any in opposition? Okay, let's add 10 minutes to the game clock and try to get through this. Thank you all. Um, okay. Where were we? Vision Zero, Mary Rose. Yeah, so we just had a Vision Zero workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, which was fruitful and involved a lot of conversation uh, with different people from different sides of the Vision Zero world. Um, we're having another, or the Vision Zero uh, committee is having a meeting 
within the next two weeks to uh, to still to be determined. So hopefully we'll have more information on that. But the plan is still to have an action plan developed by the end of the year. So hopefully we're getting that getting that done. That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, hey, that takes us to the committee reports. And I just realized I need to pull some notes up for one of them. So Nathan, I'm going to call on you first so you can give your report while I do that, please. Um, okay, S sounds good. Um, we talked about um, the e-bikes and scooter things. We talked about NAF NACTO guidelines, um, which that's going to be on the docket now. Um, we talked about what happened at Bike Walk NC, um, so, like some takeaways from that, which was when advocating for better infrastructure, framing it around safety is typically the most effective rhetoric. Um, bike Walk NC has tried to repeal the no funding for standalone bike and pe ped projects four times. There is a one holdout on the subcommittee at the General Assembly who has killed the bill all four times. Uh, he lives somewhere in the southeast of the state. I forgot which specific person it was. Um, and then the president of the Bike Walk NC mentioned that a lot of large cities in North Carolina have a legislative agenda that they set for like their, I guess, lobbyists for the General Assembly and I in December, and I was wondering if Durham has a lobbyist for the General Assembly. Um, and then we also talked about the Vision Zero workshop and trying to get Durham, oh, I have another CIP request, uh, get Durham to create a sponsored and legal tactical urbanism program. And I shared a guide that Atlanta has for their program. Um, and then also a question was, did the bike co-op ever get their lease situation fixed? Which I don't think we ever found out the answer to. I I can speak, uh, I was just at the co-op meeting on Monday, I can speak to the, the lease uh, uh, later. Okay. Carl, were you gonna say stuff? You know, I was curious about the the lease thing because it's not come before us yet. Um, I was going to say we do have we just hired for the first time in many years a lobbyist, so we do have one for the city. Um, although I should say, like that that agenda is mostly it's sort of like city governments sort of like things we want from the the state. So it's less about a broad advocacy agenda and more like kind of city city business. But um, yeah, we do have a, a lobbyist. Okay. Well, if you want to add removing the no funding for standalone bike and ped products projects to your legislative agenda. I would you should actually, that. if you send me, yeah, send me like, cause we usually have meetings. We sort of like, we pull all the stuff we want to um, share. We usually have, we sort of sit down with our legislative delegation and say, here's what we want. You know, they sort of let us know what they, what they think we should sort of move forward, move forward with. But if you want to send me a quick email, just to like put that in writing. I'm glad to like, when we okay. have our meeting, I'm glad to bring that forward. I can do that. And then, uh, Peter, you're going to talk about bike co-op. Yeah, yeah. I just, sorry, I just wanted to pull out my notes. Uh, it's a bit of a, I'm trying to think how I can make this quick because it's a long story. Uh, basically, the lease hasn't been, uh, isn't isn't finalized yet. Um, that's the the gist of it. The, uh, the, uh, the, the co-op folks are a little confused as to why. There seems to be some uh, gear grinding with uh, we're trying to add a, uh, a storage building, uh, but pulling permits for the storage building kicked a uh, permit need to do uh, to install a backflow regulator on the water. So we can't get the storage building until we get the backflow regulator on the water. And that was preceded by uh, a big hullabaloo of the dog park had to get their water main replaced, which uh, interrupted the call for a, a number of weeks because uh, of the way the water system works. So that's all to say that the lease has not been, uh, fought, uh, the, the, the new lease for, for the co-op has not been finalized. There's a, a whole string of sort of these connected issues that uh, keep popping up. That's hey, it for me. Thank, thanks for those updates. I appreciate uh, knowing that. Just for visibility, is the when is the lease actually up? Is it 
end it first of the year? Uh, oh, sorry, Carl. Oh, oh, uh, I think March ish. March. Okay. So a little time, but I realize it's probably getting tight. Yeah. Especially if, if you're having to look at a move, which I hope you're not. No, everyone's very confident it'll end up uh, unless, unless someone else is confident here, but everyone at the co-op is confident that it'll be okay. Good, so. good. I, I'm, I've been around long enough. I remember when y'all moved into that facility and it was but, not trivial. Oh, but I'm getting I, played I, off. I, if I if I could make just one quick pitch, it would be the the co-op would be uh, um, very grateful if we could start building our uh, storage building before we install a backflow regulator. Um, it is a, a, it the we're we're gonna install the backflow regulator. It, it's in the works, but yeah, uh, it would be ideal. Um, and one one of the 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 frustrations was is that the city did replace the water main because of the dog park issue uh and if the city had had to pull uh permits for the water main which if we if we if so if the co-op had replaced our own water main we would have had to pull permits and we would have been, then had to uh, do the backflow regulator then but the, since the city replaced the water main they didn't have to pull permits and so they didn't have to replace the backflow regulator and so this is, yeah, it's just adding extra time delay to the storage building. And we, we obviously, we need some more storage. So just as a, as a pitch, it would be appreciative if we could do both at the same time. But right now we're doing this sequentially because that's how, that's how things work, I guess. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Moving on to the other committees. I think I actually am fielding both of these tonight for different reasons. So let me pull my notes. Um, community engagement, uh, we had a meeting that I sort of served as an ad hoc chair for. Uh, I'll go through what we discussed real quickly. Um, I did put my minutes into the uh, drive, if anybody's curious, but uh, Andres gave us some uh, social media updates. Um, that was where we discussed around the bond referendum, took an action to draft a resolution, which we have already passed, so I can move on from that. Uh, we also talked about the NACTO resolution, which you've already heard an update on uh, on that one. Um, Ed mentioned that October 15th is White Cane Safety Day and requested BPAC social media support this, which I believe, I hope, happened since today's October 15th, I realize. Um, we had just kind of a general discussion, soliciting feedback uh, from the can opener meeting, uh, and it was really positive. Uh, felt that it was good to get out in the community, be more accessible. And then we should maybe try to do this once or twice a year. So uh, we should probably have a broader discussion about that and our public facing and in-person meetings more broadly um, in the next month or two. Um, so that's on me to pull that into the agenda. And then the last thing we discussed was me um, bullying people into being leadership for this committee, which uh, was successful. So congratulations again to Hannah, the new chair, who will give this update next month. On DevRev, uh, Scott uh, couldn't be with us tonight. He sent a quick update via email, uh, which I will summarize as we uh, went over five cases. I don't think any of them were particularly extraordinary, so I'm not going to get into them. Um, we also discussed creating a repository for the documents we generate doing these case reviews, which I think is a good idea. Um, and that repository now exists. So if you're on DevRev, and this is an action for me too, you can start maybe retroactively putting all the stuff you've generated into that. I think that's a good uh, history for us to capture for current and future members. Speaking of which, we had a really great attendance at that meeting. Uh, myself, Scott, John Lawler, who's joined that committee, Trent, who I believe is thinking about joining that committee, um, as well as Hannah. And also we had a student from UNC um, who was visiting to um, as part of a research project. So I, I hope that was helpful for her. So. But it was a really good, uh, positive meeting with DevRev. That Any questions about either of those committee meetings? That was that was the one that was in the daytime. Uh, it would have been in the evening, no. Oh, okay, because I was on one last time. I was just trying to figure it out. I think yeah. you did it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Get to the right tab again. Great. Uh, announcements and updates. I know Hannah has one. 
and a Salvaggio, sorry. I'm gonna have to be more specific. I don't have the agenda up right now. What was the update? It was about uh, safe routes to school. Oh, um, yeah. So the walk and roll to school um, month is underway right now. It's the bike walk. I don't know if it's bike is part of it, but it's walk and roll to school month. Um, and so there have been several elementary schools that have already had events so far. Um, and I think there's a couple additional events happening. Um, I think the end of this week and maybe the beginning of next week. Um, so I had shared something out um, on the email listserv about that, but yeah, if anyone's interested in volunteering or um, just learning more about it or anything, um, yeah, look at that email or reach out to me. Uh, a lot of great work that the Safe Routes to School team is doing. Very cool. Does anyone else have any announcements for the good of the order? Okay, if not, let me go through my actions and communication priorities, or actually ours, but mostly they're me. Um, so I will finalize and send the letter in support of the bond referendum. I will do that within the next 24 hours, so it's out ahead of early voting. Um, and social media promotion will follow. Um, I, I would look at Andres, but he had to step out. But I'll make sure he knows that. Um, we've kind of planned ahead for that anyway. Uh, I will clean up the e-bike letter and get it uh, presentable for an up or down vote at the next meeting. I will also start a working doc with our CIP recommendations we started tonight, which again, fantastic work on that, y'all. Really happy about that. Um, I will email a link too so everybody has that. Um, and then I will also try to set a meeting up amongst myself, Hannah, Scott, and Nathan to start working on the annual report uh, for next year. And uh, Nathan, I think you have an action email, Carl, about the legislative agenda of the city of Durham. Did I miss anything? Make sure you vote. Please make sure you vote for all the reasons. Okay, I think we finished sort of on time within our extended time with three minutes to spare. Thank you all very much. We will see you on November 19th and at committee meetings in the meantime. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Peepak. Good night, folks.